ವಸುಚಾಡೋರಮರ್ಧನಂ ದೇವಕೀ ಪರಮಂದಂ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವಂದೇ ಜಗದ್ಗುರು So welcome back to the Bhagavad Gita class. We took a short winter break. And uh, today also we've got our first snow in New York, this year's uh, snow. And we are making a new beginning in the Bhagavad Gita class also. Because uh, we have completed this up to the sixth chapter and we made a beginning of the seventh chapter, isn't it? Last time when we ended, we did the first two verses of the seventh chapter. it makes um it, it's a landmark actually because one way the bhagavad gita can be classified is 18 chapters of course but 18 chapters can be classified into three sets of six chapters each chapters 1 to 6 chapters 7 to um 12 and then 13 to 18 is the last six what is this classification about the it's based on the mahavakya tattvamasi that thou art as we know mahavakya tattvamasi is basically the essence of advaita vedanta whatever advaita vedanta wants to say it can be said so elegant you know in one sentence that thou art now thou you tvam uh, refers to the jiva the individual being you or i or all all this people all sentient beings that is what is referred to as tvam the student the one who is the vedantic uh, enquirer that is the tvam you and an enquiry into the real nature of the you that is enquiry into tvam in sanskrit in the in vedanta it is called tvam padartha shodhana an enquiry into the uh, reality of of uh, the you the sentient being the jiva who am i basically the answer to the question who am i tat means that here that means saguna brahmana ishvara and an inquiry into the nature of ishvara or, or saguna brahman that is called tat padartha shodhana and when we do these then we get the identity tattvamasi that thou art and again we can see the how whole of vedanta sara was basically to come to that point to understand what is the meaning of that thou art uh, whole of vedanta basically culminates in this teaching now one way of looking at the bhagavad gita is that the first six chapters are tvam padartha pradhana which means primarily mainly about principally about the sentient being you what is my nature what is the answer to the question who am i that's what the first six chapters are primarily about why am i saying uh, primarily because other things are also there Uh, but primarily for example in the second chapter straight away sri krishna goes into the nature of the atman who am i that you are not the body or the mind you are this uh, pure consciousness which is immortal beyond change beyond birth and death that's what he teaches arjuna and that is the um, nature of tvam the individual being now having done that in the first six chapters we come to the seventh chapter and the distinct change is noticed here chapter 7 to 12 is tat prad- uh, padartha pradhana primarily about tat that what is that god what do i mean by god here what i mean by god is bhagavan saguna brahman ishvara the god of religion the theistic religions worship god so in vaishnavism it is uh, vishnu Uh, in shaktaism in sh- the shakta tradition it is the divine mother durga or kali um, and in shaivism it is shiva in islam it is um, uh, allah in christianity it is the father in heaven and so on so the theistic god the god who is the god of religion that is the meaning of tat and uh, that is the s- subject of the chapters 7 to 12 and when we look at it we will see yes there is a certain logic to saying that because we will see from this chapter onwards the talk is mostly about god it's no longer about uh, who am i i am not the body i am not the mind i am the unchanging atman and the illuminer of body mind that part is done it is m- more about god how to realize that atman um, by the vedantic inquiry 
and how do I purify the mind by karma yoga? That part is done, chapter 1 to 6. But this, now what will happen? It is about God and the primary sadhana here will be bhakti. There will be more and more talk of devotion, of love. Um, that is chapters 7 to 12. Again, I am saying primarily because other things are also there. And then um, chapters 13 to 18, again, will reaffirm the great identity that thou art plus many, many other things. A lot of sadhana, a lot of uh, other things will be talked about there. And uh, so we are entering this second uh, uh, phase of the Bhagavad Gita where it talks about God primarily. Uh, in fact, in this six chapters, the twelfth chapter, which this section will end with, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. The twelfth chapter is all about bhakti. It is bhakti yoga actually. Now, we have started chapter 7 and we saw Sri Krishna promises Arjuna the highest knowledge. Sri Bhagavan Uvacha Maya Sakta Manah Partha Yogam Yunjan Madashraya Asamshayam Samagram Mam Yatagyasya Sita Srinu. O Arjuna, with your mind set upon me um, and taking refuge in me, practicing yoga, yogam yunjan. That, so, I believe in God. I have taken uh, refuge in God. So, I need not practice anything more. People used to ask this. Um, uh, Swami Brahmananda, devotee, is asking. So, uh, someone who has seen Sri Ramakrishna, uh, they will attain liberation. Is it not so? Do they have to practice any uh, spiritual disciplines? They are always looking for shortcut. So, I have seen Sri Ramakrishna, then that is so great. After all, Sri Ramakrishna is so great. If I have seen Sri Ramakrishna, I need not practice any spiritual disciplines. What we need to do or not, not do, that's a different matter. But the attitude is, I don't want to practice spiritual disciplines. So the question would be then, what do you want to do? As the Holy Mother said, if God has given you fingers, repeat the name of God on your fingers. What else do you want to do with the body? Either it will be God or the world. See, what is hidden in that agenda that I will not practice spiritual disciplines is that then I want to, there are certain things I want to do in the world then. My moksha, liberation, that's a difficult thing. If it is taken care of, I can now happily go back and uh, do my stuff in the world. No. Yogam yunjan. Um, practicing yoga. What yoga? Whatever has been taught. Jnana yoga, karma yoga has been taught. Practicing yoga. And two, two conditions are given here. Maya saktamana, your mind attached, uh, mind given to me. Madashra, you have taken refuge in me, in God or in Avatara. I think which commentator was it? I think Shankaracharya, I think, or Madhusudan Saraswati, who says, what's the difference between the two? If I've taken refuge in God, my mind will be on God. Not necessarily. He says, like the, um, the servant of a king who has taken refuge in the king. That means the king is my master. But the mind is on other things. So I've taken refuge in, in the master who is my boss. But my mind is not on my boss. My mind is on how much money I'm getting, what will I do after the job today, uh, on uh, my wife, husband, kids at home. My, wife, my mind is on many other things, not on the boss. And luckily, I mean, naturally, of course. But when it comes to God, it will not do. I take refuge in God and my thoughts should be also about God. Then he says, Asam Shayam, there is no doubt you will realize me and in totality. So in Vedanta, when you say in totality, what it means is you will realize that highest truth, that Aham Brahmasmi. When the Vedanta teaches Tattvamasi, that thou art, what will be our realization? It will not be Tattvamasi. Then it will be the continuous back and forth between guru and disciple. The guru says Tattvamasi, that thou art. And disciple should realize Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. Disciple should not realize Tattvamasi. <laughs> they send, say that to the Guru again. So, that realization, uh, the highest realization, the final realization, my real nature is this infinite existence. That will come to you. Again, he says, in the second verse, again, we have done all these things. Jnanam te ham sabi jnanam idam vakshami asheshapa. He says, I will tell you jnana and vijnana. These two terms, and we discussed last time, little problematic terms. Um, one interpretation, what is jnana and what is vijnana? Because Krishna is saying, I will teach you two things, jnana and vijnana. Having known which, he says, 
Bhuyo anyat gyatabhyam navashishyate. Nothing else remains after this. This is complete. So what is the, what are these two things? Traditional interpretation was that jnana um, um, means what you get by studying Vedanta. And vijnana means the realization. So people often say, I have understood it, but I have not realized it. A classical Vedantin who is trained in traditional Advaita Vedanta will say, I have not understood it then. And so you have to go back and again listen to it and again think it through. Now, having studied and acquired the knowledge, uh, that is jnana, knowledge, and making it a living reality, that it is true, I, I see that it's a fact, and that is vijnana. That is the traditional interpretation. Why am I saying traditional interpretation? Because other interpretations are also there. We last, I think a couple of years ago, we discussed with Ayan Maharaj, um, who has done an analysis of what Sri Ramakrishna used to say, Vijnana, Jnana and Vijnana, Vijnana Vedanta. Ayan Maharaj has given the term. What Sri Ramakrishna said is, realization is Jnana. And then a fuller or fullest realization is Vijnana. It's not what you get by Jnana, knowledge is not what you get by reading uh, Vedanta. It's already realized. The person who has got Jnana is a Jnani, is already a realized person. But there is a fuller realization possible. What is this fuller realization? Again, we discussed it last time, but it's something like this. Sri Ramakrishna said that uh, uh, when one feels the existence of God, that it is there, that is Jnana. But when one becomes intimate with God, one feels that God is everywhere. And there's nothing but God, that is Vijnana. He gave examples. One example was that uh, one goes up the staircase, leaving the first floor, second floor behind and going to the roof of the house. And then he discovers that the highest point of the house, the roof of the house, whatever it is made of, he says the same brick, lime and concrete. It is the same thing that the rest of the house is made of, whatever I left behind by doing neti neti. That is also the same, uh, same substance, same reality. Similarly, when one through in Vedanta, I am not the body, not the mind, and leave the world behind, body, senses, mind, and realize that reality. Satchidananda, I am that, Aham Brahmasmi. But, and that's jnana. But, when I look back upon what I left, that is also nothing other than Satchidananda. So, mind, senses, body, universe, there's nothing other than God. God alone is everything, whatever we experience in the universe. That Sri Ramakrishna says is Vijnana. Another example he gave was very vivid. Some people have heard what is milk. They've heard about milk. And that is uh, people who have read, like people who have read about Vedanta, heard about it. They've got some kind of understanding of it. But there are some people who have seen milk. And there are the others who have drunk that milk and become nourished by it and become healthy by it. So, Vijnana is that, that third category. The first category is those who have some inkling about it, some interest in it, have some kind of understanding of it. Um, and the second category is those who have seen it. The third category is who have, those who have drunk the milk. And similarly, there are those who have got some understanding of religion and spirituality, then those who have realized. And those who are fully realized. That, that's what Ramakrishna calls Vijnana. So there is this distinction between Jnana and Vijnana. Um, it's an interesting distinction. You can make it. It's an uh, interesting point to make. Sri Ramakrishna uh, consistently made that point. All right. Now we will go ahead. You know, what is the difference, this Jnana and Vijnana? I was reading Madhusudan Saraswati's commentary. Um, by the way, if you want to read one extensive commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, classical commentary, there are many, many, many commentaries on Bhagavad Gita, but a classical commentary in the tradition of Advaita Vedanta, which is very extensive. I am saying extensive because Adi Shankaracharya's commentary is, of course, foundational, but it's not as extensive. I mean, he took it for granted that people were super intelligent like him, I think. But more comprehensive, most comprehensive you will find is Madhusudan Saraswati's uh, commentary. It is called Gudhartha Deepika, the lamp of profound meaning. So that which reveals the profound meaning of Bhagavad Gita. Every word he has given some interpretation and uh, in-depth meaning. 
So, of course, it's a huge book, uh, the Gudhartha Deepika. You'll be interested to know a full course is offered at Harvard University on Gudhartha Deepika of Madhusudan Saraswati. <laughs> um, one, one whole paper is there. And the text they use is the translation, they use the English translation of Gudhartha Deepika by Swami Gambhirarandaji, uh, our 11th president, president of our order. Um, so, why am I bringing this up? Madhusudan Saraswati in the Gudhartha Deepika, he explains what is Jnana and what is Vijnana. According to him, this Vijnana, the full realization, is, um, he says, when by the realization of the teachings of Vedanta, by Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana, when it comes to fulfillment, you realize this entire reality, the, the only reality that there exists is Sat. Sanmatra, pure being. And everything in the universe, Kalpitam, is, a, is imagined, is an appearance, dreamlike, in that pure being. When you realize that, what Krishna says, nothing more remains to be realized. He says, Madhusudan Saraswati comments, that is the real state in which nothing more ne remains to be realized. But everything is, he says, Badita. Badita means, uh, is a uh, a superimposition or an appearance, like a dreamlike appearance, like a magic display in one perfect, unlimited being, and which is you, your real being. See, that's perfect. Then uh, one might say, that sounds great. Then what more remains after that? See, what more remains after that? That is the uh, interesting thing that Sri Ramakrishna points out. Yes, everything is imagined in that. And therefore, there is only one absolute reality. Fine. But that which is imagined in it, what is the status of that? What is the body? What is the mind? What, um, uh, what are they? Those they imagine, fine, they are imaginations. They are names and forms. Fine. But isn't it a fact that those names and forms, those body, mind, universe, they are also nothing but that pure being? Whatever you imagine on the rope, somebody thought it was a snake. Somebody thought it was a flower garland. Somebody thought it was a crack in the ground uh, or a trickle of water. You know, this is the classic example given in Vedanta texts. There's a rope in the semi-darkness, suppose, in, in, you know, in the, some village somewhere near a temple. And somebody, there's a group of friends going and they suddenly see, somebody says, oh, Sarpa, snake, be careful. The other one says, no, 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 not a snake. This is uh, Pushpamala. This is a flower garland discarded from the temple. And the third one says that um, it is a Jaladhara. It's a trickle of water. Uh, or someone says, the fourth one says it's a Bhuchidra, a crack on the ground. What is it actually? All of those things are superimposed. They are all imaginations, errors on one Adhishthana. Adhishthana means ground. What is the ground? Rope. Rope is the only reality that there is. It's not a snake. Not a, a flower garland, not a crack in the earth, not a trickle of water. It's just a rope. Now, if somebody were to ask, then that snake which is experienced by that person, surely maya, error, whatever it is, that um, rope, which uh, that flower garland, the trickle of water, that crack on the earth, what are they? You can't say there is a separate error. No, they are actually nothing but the rope. So if you stress that everything that you experience in the world, yes, it is Maya, but it is actually nothing but Brahman, then you have Vijnana, according to um, Sri Ramakrishna. Then it's an important point because that's how you live life. That's how you deal with the world. Otherwise, an implication could be you could dismiss the world then. And then you could remain. There's no harm in dismissing the world. There are yogis who remain absorbed uh, in, in that perfect, limitless reality. Nothing to be blamed there. That's what Narendranath wanted when he experienced Nirvikalpa Samadhi for the first time. And then Sri Ramakrishna said, now what do you want next? He said, nothing more. I just want to remain in that state. Once in a while, I'll come down for a snack and then from that state and go back and remain absorbed in that. And Sri Ramakrishna scolded him. He said, fie upon you. I thought you were greater than that. I thought you would be like this vast banyan tree under which whose shade thousands of people for ages to come will get shelter. 
But what Narendranath was asking for is not a small thing. It is seen as the goal of spiritual life. Sri Ramakrishna is saying something higher, of course, but still. So, um, higher than that is Vijnana, to see everything as God and interact with everything as God. Now, all of this, one commentator, I think Shankaracharya probably says that having attracted the student's mind with these, this, these sayings, so verses 1 and 2 was advertisement. I will tell you that knowledge along with special knowledge, jnana along with vijnana, after which nothing will remain for you to know. You can imagine Arjuna must have been uh, you know, enthused, inspired. Yes, then this is the course for me. I will take this. Chapter 7 is the chapter for me. Tell me. Then Krishna says, um, Oh, the advertisement is still continuing. Number 3. Manushyanam sahasreshu kaschid yatati siddhaye yatatam api siddhanam kaschin manveti tattvata. Among thousands of men, one perchance struggles for perfection. Even amongst those who that struggle, one perchance becomes perfect. And even amongst those that are perfect, one perchance knows mean reality. All right. Basically, this is also advertisement because it is uh, supposed to be uh, about how difficult and rare this knowledge is so that um, you, can, you can be attracted towards it, that it only very few people get it and you are going to get this knowledge now. He says, Manushyanam Sahasra. So among millions, Sahasra means thousands, but among millions and billions of human beings, very few are there, those who work for moksha. Siddhi here means perfection, but the commentator makes it clear it is moksha. They are talking about God realization. Very rare are those who are working for moksha. So Those who are gathered here are among those very rare ones who are working for moksha, who are inspired for that. Among those who are um, trying to get moksha, God realization, enlightenment, only one perchance realizes me, the, gets the ultimate realization, which I'm going to tell you now. So, uh, what is this is a verse which is often quoted the rarity of spiritual life. Many, many people are attracted to religion. Many, many people. Either they're attracted or they're conventionally religious in all the worlds, all the civilizations of the world, everywhere. But you will notice in that religiosity, it's either out of tradition, my parents, grandparents did it, and I'm also doing it. And it's a nice thing to do. It's a part of our culture. Or out of um, desire to satisfy worldly needs. I want certain things in the world, and therefore I'm taking the help of God. Many people around the world, sincere, good people, they think that is the purpose of religion. What else is the purpose of religion? It is to improve our life here. That's it. Um, one of interesting thing I noted during my time at the Harvard Divinity School among the professors, some of them and most of the students not all again the whole idea was what are we doing here what is this religion, how can it help us it will help us in fulfilling our social goals to make a better society this is the ideal it will help us in LGBTQ plus movement. It will help us in uh, you know, the green society. It will help us to establish liberal values in society against racism. All sorts of social uh, activist programs. Uh, religion is meant to help us to establish a better society. And that's the goal of religion. And uh, what else can it be? You see, uh, <laughs> it is... It is difficult to argue against something that is good. You can argue against something that is bad, but something that is good is difficult to argue. No, the higher purpose of religion in all the religions of the world is ultimately um, moksha, nirvana, kaivalya, salvation, whatever you call it. There is this ultimate purpose of religion. So Sri Krishna says, most people don't get it. So many people may be religious, many may be not religious, but among those who are religious, spiritual are very few. Um, and so, 
very few among billions of people take up spirituality as uh, seriously as as the goal of their life and among those who take it up those who will ultimately realize also those are even fewer only one in a thousand spiritual seekers the one should not be disheartened that way if the chance of success is so low why should i do it i have told you on other occasions also that uh, once you take this up first of all the benefits is not that at the end i will get uh, brahma gyan i will realize i am brahman till that time it's a hard boring useless slogging uh, waste of time <laughs> somehow i have to do it with a sour face no until that point also moment to moment day to day we get the benefits we get peace of mind we get blessings in our life from uh, from ishwara we uh, we become we get peace in ourselves and we become a source of peace and blessing for others it is the most important thing in our life the benefits that we get day to day even long before enlightenment swalpam apyasya dharmasya trayate mahato bhaya even a little practice of spirituality saves you from great fear that's the promise even a little practice of this saves you from great fear great sorrow in in life it saves you also once uh, you have started on this path once one gets the taste of it you will feel what else equals this nothing matches this even long before i get enlightened perfected huh, realize my buddha nature or i am brahman even before that Uh, what else matches this this is the highest thing in, in uh, human life the greatest adventure of human life and we are blessed that we have begun it and the final thing is that uh, you will have to do it anyway and success is guaranteed in this time or, or next lifetime sri ramakrishna says in banaras which is the place of mother annapurna nobody goes hungry some are fed in the morning some in the afternoon but some have to wait till sunset now his language sunset means doesn't sound too bad i, I can wait till sunset sunset here means the end of the universe <laughs> the mahapralaya so but you have to wait um, once one starts on this path success is guaranteed so for these reasons one need not feel bad one in a thousand will get success means right now in this life here itself one in a thousand may get it Now, who knows that you will not be that and and for every one of us success is guaranteed so there are rare are the persons who walk on this path and those who walk on this path rare are those who get enlightenment that means rare are the persons who undertake this vedantic shravana manana nididhyasana among millions billions only a few will undertake and among those who undertake a few get brahma gyana uh, right away here but others will definitely there is no failure a little more broadly we can say there are very few who are attracted to spiritual life first of all and then very few who come to this knowledge that krishna is giving what is this knowledge this knowledge of vedanta because after you get attracted to spiritual life now is supermarket of spirituality out there some of them are real paths um, which are powerful effective traditional some are spurious when they are all there equally shining before you and often the spurious ones or the um, uh, not so deep ones are advertised and pushed much more strongly and uh, people get sidetracked sometimes many types of teachings are available among all of them this i will say i of course i am an advaitin so i have to say this advaita is definitely the last word and it is said um you know as to put it this way that advaita is a finishing school for spirituality in today's age there are people who go to different you know meditation techniques and then you know they come up to tantra and shaiva kashmiri shaivism and buddhism and so on finally come to uh, finishing school advaita now you say that only because you are in advaita and you are uh, advertising it so much it is true but then i am quoting um avadhuta gita text of advaita vedanta the first verse is ishvara anugraha deva pumsa advaita vasana 
by the special grace of Ishvara. When we say Ishvara, we think about bhakti, God, you know, devotion to God. But this book says it is the special grace of Ishvara that you have a liking for non-dualism, Advaita Vedanta. Ishvara Nugraha Deva Pumsam Advaita Vasana. This is the highest finishing school, final word. And just because you have got the final word, the highest, does not mean that you cannot do other things. You can certainly keep on doing. It has no, the beauty of Advaita Vedanta is, it has no conflict with anything else. Uh, Avivada, Mandukya Upanishad, Gaudapada says, Avivada, there is no conflict here in this teaching. Um, Avirud, uh, Avirodha, there is no conflict with any other spiritual path on this te- uh, in this teaching. Asparsha Yoga, the non-contact, non-duality uh, of Advaita Vedanta. Um, Parasparam Virudhyante, he says, all the other teachings contradict each other and they fight among each other. But there is no conflict with Advaita Vedanta. Of course, the commentator there says, why there is no conflict with Advaita Vedanta, that may make others wild. He says, because between the truth and the falsity, there is no conflict. If two contradictory truths can conflict, if one says A, another says B, then there is a conflict. But if one is between the rope and the snake, there is no conflict. Because the only rope exists. The snake is a mistake. So there is no conflict. Between the desert and the mirage, there is no conflict. Because how can it be both the sand and water? Because it is sand. It's not water. It just looks like that. So it is by the special grace of Ishwara that you have a liking for non-duality. Um, I remember this was quoted to me by a monk in Swargashram in Rishikesh. I had gone in search of non-dualist monks. Of course, that's my pet uh, hobby. That was in 2004. And then somebody, I got a list of non-dualist monks from other other monks who lived there. One particular monk, I won't take the name, other monks told me that you go and ask him, he is, his teachings will be to your liking. But don't mention um, devotion, bhakti, God, he will get very annoyed. So I went and I had a brief talk with him. Not much uh, of a talk. I just went just once. Uh, but when I asked him about Advaita, he was so happy. He said, Ishwara Nugraha Deva Pumsam Advaita Vasana. This desire for Advaita comes by a very special grace of Ishwara. So what is the meaning of this verse? Among thousands of, or billions of human beings, a few become interested in spirituality. All will, but in many, many lifetimes. Many lifetimes of suffering are necessary and experience are necessary. And those who are walking on the path of spiritual life, um, among them only a few will get this fullest realization. Which fullest realization? I'm going to tell you now. I'm going to give it, give this to you now. The full knowledge, complete knowledge. Uh, vijnana, Jnana and Vijnana. Now, having attracted the mind of the student by this advertisement, he's going to start teaching. This um, verses 4 and 5 should go together. This is a bit import, two important verses. Bhumi rapo nalo vayo kangmano buddhirevacha ahankara iti yamme Bhinna prakriti rashtadha apareyam itastvanyam prakritim vidhime param jiva bhuta mahabaho yaidam dharyate jagat earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intellect and egoism. Thus is my prakriti nature divided into eight categories. This is my lower prakriti. Different from this, O mighty armed one, know that higher prakriti of mine in the form of the individual soul, jiva, by which this world is sustained. All right. These are also famous verses and uh, sometimes they are quoted in other scriptures also and come by commentators. So what's going on here? For this, again, you will see why Vedantasar is so useful. So what is this universe? What is God? What are we and what is this universe? All of that he has said in these two verses. So this is the highest teaching. Um, what is this universe? 
according to Advaita Vedanta, consciousness only is the only reality that there is. But all this diversity, all this doesn't seem to be consciousness only. I know I feel conscious, but then there's so much. I have thoughts and feelings. I have the senses. I have this body and this vast universe, living and non-living things. What's all this? This does not seem to be consciousness only. So, a term is introduced, Prakriti. Maya, Prakriti. Consciousness and its power, Prakriti. Now, if you remember um, Vedanta Sar, what happens then? This Prakriti has two aspects, total and individual, samashti, vyashti. Total prakriti, the consciousness has no total or individual. It is just one, undivided. But prakriti is a total and individual. So total prakriti is called maya. And the individual, the parts of prakriti, the tiny fragments of prakriti are called ignorance or ajnana. Now, this consciousness in association with the total prakriti or maya is called Ishwara or Saguna Brahman. What is the definition of Ishwara or Saguna Brahman which we saw in, Adv- in Vedanta Sara? Samashti Agyana Upahita Chaitanya. Uh, consciousness limited by, associated with the total prakriti, Samashti Agyana. I'm not using the direct translation to ignorance. Agyana means ignorance. If you literally translate, what is God? God is the consciousness limited by total ignorance. If I am a little fool, God is a big fool then. No, it does not mean that. Uh, it is like total ignorance and partial ignorance are, are like, Sri Ramakrishna put it very beautifully. He said, the poison in the mouth of the cobra, a tiny bit of it is enough to knock out um, a frog or a mouse, the prey of the cobra. All of the poison is in the mouth of the cobra. It does no harm to the cobra. Not only does not do any harm to the cobra, it is the power of the cobra. Similarly, Maya does no harm to God, to Ishwara. In fact, Maya is the power of Ishwara. Brahman becomes Ishwara. Nirguna Brahman becomes Ishwara with the power of Maya. But a tiny bit of it, a fraction of it, is enough to send us, the jiva, into delusion, into samsara, endless samsara tiny fraction of it. Um, so that consciousness in association with a fraction of maya, with a, with a tiny bit of prakriti, is called jiva. Now, what does Ishwara do? Ishwara, using the power of maya, creates the universe. What is the universe? Um, it is the five elements. The uh, five elements, we remember from Vedanta Sar, this creation Srishti is done in two stages. Sukshma, Sthula. First subtle, then um, gross, physical. The subtle level, the five subtle elements are produced first. First, that Ishwara with Maya appears as Akasha, space. Subtle space, not the space we think. And then that space evolves further uh, into into, uh, Vayu, air. And these are technical terms. It's not just the breeze which we feel here. And then that evolves into Agni, fire. And that evolves further into um, water. And that evolves further into earth. So these are all this ancient cosmology, which you, in fact was found in most cultures of the world, in ancient cultures. Some talked about four elements, some about five elements. Uh, space, air, uh, fire, water, earth. What are these according to Vedanta? Nothing other than that pure consciousness through ignorance appearing this way. And it's not difficult to understand. Just think about the dream example. It's a fantastic example. In the dream, there is a whole universe. Presumably, there is air, water, space, uh, fire, uh, earth. What is the space there in dreams? Is it really there is a vast sky there which you see? No. It is you, the dreamer, refracted through the lens of the dream itself, through the sleep. The sleep is like Maya. First of all, you forget yourself and you yourself appear as the space. You yourself appear as the water and the earth and the fire and the air. You yourself appear as the jiva in your dream. Not one jiva, all jivas. And you yourself interact with all of that and start a dream samsara. Exactly like that, uh, Ishwara with Maya projects the 
five subtle elements. And then these subtle elements combine to make our minds, the cosmic mind uh, and uh, the powers of the senses and so on. And then they combine to become the gross universe, the physical universe. So in two stages, Ishwara creates the universe. First a subtle stage and then a physical or a gross stage. And then what happens to the jivas? Who are the jivas? The same consciousness with a fraction of uh, ig- that uh, maya, with, ig- with a little bit of ignorance. What happens? They are projected now. Why am I saying they? Isn't consciousness one? True, consciousness is one. But when it becomes associated with numerous fra- um, you know, uh, fractions of maya, parts of maya, it appears as many. So one consciousness appears as many, many jivas. If you don't believe it, look at the count of people in this Zoom meeting. You'll see 83, not one. So 83, but actually we are one consciousness. Uh, fragmented as if, as if fragmented because of uh, our individual ignorance. Ajnana. That individual ignorance forms each of our causal body. Karana Sharira. And Ishwara provides us through the power of his maya he has created, provides us each with a subtle body and from time to time uh, with a physical body, gross body. Sukshma Sharira, Stula Sharira. And here we are. Here is a universe created by Ishwara. Here is a body and um, here is a mind. And I am here uh, as this limited consciousness, consciousness limited by individual ignorance. So, this worldview and these, these jivas, what, what's going on? What's the purpose of all of these? These limited jivas are now looking to find their way back to that unlimited consciousness, which is they themselves, which is their own real nature, which has not undergone any change. Um, now they are going to go back and Ishwara, who is the same unlimited consciousness, is helping these jivas to come home. Uh, by creating this entire universe and this whole game of life and death, many lifetimes it goes on. So this is the, um, sort of in brief, the cosmology. All of this, Sri Krishna now puts it in a slightly new way or old way. What I have said is Vedanta Sara is a sort of finished product. Uh, Looking at all of this, a systematized presentation has been given to us in Vedanta Sara. Thousands of years before this, same idea Sri Krishna is saying. He says, I have two natures. What are the two natures? One is material nature, one is conscious nature. What is the material nature? Maya and all its products. What is the conscious nature? I, the consciousness, uh, who am reflected in little bits of Maya, I am called this sentient being, the jivas. And it is for these sentient beings that the universe is created, is sustained, finally dissolved, again created, until they all get enlightenment. So Ishwara, that is consciousness plus Maya, is the cause of the universe. And what cause? Vedanta Sar, if you remember, Abhinna Nimitta Upadana Karana. The one um, integral, material and um, the, the instrumental cause. What is this material instrumental cause? Suppose there is wood which has become your furniture. It doesn't become by itself. The carpenter who comes and transforms the wood into furniture. So the carpenter is called the nimitta karana, the intelligent cause or the instrumental cause, the one who transforms the wood into furniture. And the wood is the material of the furniture, the upadana karana. Upadana means material. Similarly, potter and clay and pots. Clay is the upadana karana material. Potter is the the instrumental cause, nimitta karana, and pot is the product. What about the universe? What is the material cause? What is the instrumental cause? Upadana karana and uh, nimitta karana. There is no distinction here. It's not a crude idea like there is a separate creator, there is some material uh, like clay and then like potter made pot out of the clay, God makes the universe out of some material. Not like that. There is only one reality. And that itself appears as this universe. So, that's why Vedanta says, God alone, Ishwara alone, Saguna Brahman alone is the Abhinna Nimitta Upadana Karana. Consciousness plus Maya is the material out of which the entire universe is projected. 
and is also the cause of it, the intelligent cause, the intelligence which designs, projects this entire universe. Here is, by the way, till now, the big difference between a religious point of view and a scientific, materialistic scientific point of view. See, we sort of feel that the clay cannot become a pot by itself. The wood cannot assemble itself into furniture. If you don't believe me, then you go to IKEA, you see what will happen to you. If you wait for it to be assemble itself, then you are in trouble. You have to do, do it all. Now, you are the instrumental cause. And the materials which IKEA will provide you with is the material cause. But what does science say? No instrumental cause is necessary. No intelligence is necessary. By the very forces of nature, nature sort of assembles itself into this universe. So it is some kind of super IKEA. It assembles itself. You don't need any intelligence outside it. Um, that is the materialistic science. I mean, our modern science would say that. All you need is the initial set of conditions which produced the Big Bang. Now, how that happened, nobody knows what was there before that and how that happened. And after that, uh, the forces of evolution, which from beginnings of organic life till this point, they can produce all life forms. Now, there are arguments for this and against this. I will not go into it. That's a huge area separately. But the worldview that we are ta talking about, what Krishna is talking about, is a religious worldview. You have material cause and instrumental cause. Except in most religions, you will find God is the instrumental cause, intelligence. But God is not the material of the universe. So God is different and material of the universe. It's more like a carpenter and wood situation or potter and clay situation. But in Advaita Vedanta, in Vedanta, in fact, it is one reality. Because the question is, what other material would be there apart from God? There's only one reality. Again and again, you've said, so that must be the only one. And it's there in the Upanishads. The Upanishads say, Mundaka Upanishad, um, Yathor Nanabhi Srijate Grinhate Cha Yatha Pritibya Moshadhaya Sambhavanti Yatha Sata Purushat Keshalomani Tatha Kshara Sambhavati Havishwam. How does the entire universe come from this uh, consciousness? It says, just as from a spider, a web is produced. And notice, Uddhanabhi, that's the word for the spider, beautiful word for a spider. Notice that the, the spider produces the web out of its own body. Vedanta says, the spider, the sentient being, the jiva called spider, is the uh, nimitta karana, is the instrumental cause. And the body of the spider is the upadana karana, is the material cause. And the web is the creation. So that being who is in the body of the spider, from that body produces this web. Out of its own intelligence, it, it designs the web. Exactly like that, Saguna Brahman and Maya. Maya is the body from which the universe emerges. And Saguna Brahman is the consciousness, which is the intelligence behind all of this. Now you might say the spider does a lot of work and the poor spider, every, every Sunday we go and clean it up and wipe out all the webs, the poor spider. So is God, God like that? Does God have to do a lot of work to create this universe? No, effortlessly. So the next example is, um, as from the earth, shrubs and herbs and plants emerge effortlessly. Similarly, um, the universe emerges from Saguna Brahman. So the earth is an inert thing. So are you saying it's some kind of uh, ultimately like physics, some inert, non-conscious material from which the universe is coming? No. That's why the third example is given. As from a living being, uh, hair emerges from our body. The hair is actually dead um, and it emerges from a living being. Similarly, the non-conscious universe, the universe which is an object, emerges from the subject. The, that universe which is limited emerges or appears in the unlimited. That which is uh, full of sorrow and suffering emerges from that which is blissful. That which is completely given to change, always modifying and change, it emerges from the changeless uh, absolute. So just like that, tathakshara sambhavati havishwam. Then this, this universe emerges from the uh, akshara. Akshara is consciousness, the absolute consciousness. So then this akshara is 
अभिन्न निमित्त उपादान कारण वन नॉन डिफरेंट इंस्ट्रूमेंटल मेटीरियल कॉज Now what does um, Sri Krishna say? So here are these two uh, prakritis of mind. He says, "I have got two prakritis. One is material prakriti, this entire universe, including your body, your mind also is part of material prakriti. And I have got jivas, the sentient beings, who are my higher prakriti, my higher nature. This higher nature, lower nature, this kind of categorization we did not find in Vedanta Sar. This is something unique to what Sri Krishna is saying." So he says, "What is my lower nature? Bhumi, earth, apa, water, anala, fire, vayu, air, come, space. So these are not the physical, the gross entities. There are there's a subtle uh, elements. This this is the first stage of creation. And mana, buddhi, ahankara, mind, intellect, and uh, ego." but these are also actually technical terms borrowed from sankhya not our the way we are feeling mind and intellect and ego right now these are bhinna prakriti ashtada they are eight fold prakriti if you count them the five elements um, earth water fire air space five and then six is mind seven is uh, intellect and eight is ahankar ego eight fold lower prakriti material prakriti objective prakriti then he says aparayam itastu all this is lower prakriti now i have a higher prakriti higher nature what is the higher nature you o arjuna all of these sentient beings all human beings and all of these horses and elephants all of the birds and creatures of the world all beings all sentient beings the consciousness in them that is my higher nature but isn't that you why are you calling it your nature see you ishwar what are you your consciousness plus maya so all the consciousness in all of us isn't it you isn't it one with you ultimately yes but right now it does not seem so what you see as the consciousness in all of them that is my lower nature and that uh, that is my higher nature it's still my nature it's my power and it is because of this he says yaya dharyate jagat because of this universe is sustained i am playing this game of the universe uh, creation preservation destruction birth life death i am playing this game this whole thing exists it exists because of you we we trust the whole thing upon god why is god doing all this god is saying that why are you doing all this why don't you become enlightened then we can finish this game you want to play what can i do i am just letting you play i am giving you the playground i am i i we will say that but we don't remember when did i ask to play so that you don't remember krishna said to arjuna at the beginning of uh, the bhagavad gita uh, i mean in that in chapter 4 we have had many many lives arjuna was when i said um, you don't remember i remember all my lives and i remember all of your lives also So this is the difference between an ordinary jivan mukta and god an avatar and jivan mukta may have the power to remember his or her own past lives that much but god an incarnation of god alone has the power to remember all past incarnations and also all of the uh, others all beings who come to them they know their past and present they know our past and present whatever has gone on in our lifetimes and whatever is yet to come for us they know that uh, any many times in sri ram krishna's life you see this demonstrated again and again holy mother's life also uh, one of the most stunning incidents is when she went to visit rameshwar uh, rameshwaram in the south of india and the temple there where there's a, uh, the shiva the shiva linga and this place there sita had worshiped and the holy mother just muttered just the way i left it jamunti rekhe gechila and then people around him what did you say and she said no no, no nothing nothing it's just nothing forget it um and others lives also she went to bodh gaya uh, and in bodh gaya um she saw a group of english men and women admiring the architecture of some of the 
ruins, I think in Nalanda or somewhere there, not Nalanda, somewhere else, near that, some temple, uh, a Buddhist Vihara. And then the Holy Mother said to the, her companions around, look, they, they, in their past lives, many, many centuries ago, they are the ones who built these. And now they have come back and they are admiring their own work. Um, so they know the past and present. So this is Ishvara. And our we sentient beings do not know. We are playing this game. That's why Ishvara is creating the universe. So that we come to enlightenment. That's the basic cosmology of, of Vedanta. Advaita has something more to say. Advaita will say, yes, that's all fine. Good. It's a good story. But the fact is, you are none other than Brahman. And that's the only reality that there is. But anyway, we are spoiled sports. This is a grand story there. They are just calling it. See, don't forget, it's a story only. Um, yes. Yayedam dharyate jagat. One sadhu, Ramananda Saraswati, told us this. The cosmic game of hide and seek. Right now, God is hiding. And we are all seeking God. Where is God? Where is God? We are playing hide and seek. Little children are seeking uh, God who is hiding. And when the universe ends... Uh, Sri Ramakrishna says, at sunset, in the evening when night falls and the universe ends and all this game is over, those who have not got liberation at that time, there will be many, they will go back into the seed form, will be absorbed back into Prakriti until the next universe is created. So then Ramananda Saraswati said, at that time, we all hide and God alone is there now and God is now searching. When did those fellows go? And so he finds us and he creates the universe and he throws us out there to play again and he hides himself and then we keep searching. So this cosmic, not cosmic, multi-cosmic game of hide and seek is going on. It's a nice way of putting it. But Sri Krishna says, Yairam dharyate jagat, by which this entire universe, this game of this universe is sustained. All right. Let me quickly take a look at the questions. So it's a very profound teaching. I mean, in this two verses, he has just given the entire Vedantic worldview. Not just Vedantic, actually. This is Upanishadic and also Sankhya. There are elements of Upanishads here, elements of Sankhya here. Vishwanath Kara says, Swami, Swamiji, can the three levels of knowledge be mapped to Paroksha, Pratyaksha, Ap Aparoksha, Jnana? As in the tenth level, tenth man story. Three levels of knowledge means? Um, can you unmute and say three levels means? Somebody you had described for the milk. You said somebody knows, reads about milk and then sees. Oh, milk then, yeah. yes. Mm, only to a certain extent. Paroksha, you're right. Who has just read about milk. That's Paroksha. So we have read about Vedanta. We have heard about these things. Maybe we have some beliefs, some understanding also. Now, um, the one who has seen milk, that is not only Pratyaksha, that's Aparoksha Nubhuti. Because... Uh, Atman cannot be Pratyaksha anyway. So when one actually realizes it, it is Aparokshanabhuti. And beyond that, the Vijnana stage, uh, according to the classical commentators, the Jnana stage is this Paroksha state. What is Jnana? It is Paroksha Jnana. You have read about it. What is Vijnana? Aparokshanabhuti. I am Brahman. And Sri Ramakrishna's way of putting it was, this Aparokshanabhuti is Jnana. I am Brahman. And Vijnana is then the further uh, realization that as long as this body exists, Jivan Mukta state is going on, whatever is experienced is nothing other than Brahman. And that's the ultimate truth. You can see it is just an extension of uh, Advaita Vedanta. And in fact, it is not as revolutionary as um, suppose, uh, you know, like Ayan Maharaj is talking about Vijnana Vedanta. But if you see the teachings of the traditional Advaita teachers, it is perfectly, it is sort of exactly what they are saying. Um, I mean, I've heard in Uttarakhand sadhus when they teach uh, Advaita Vedanta, they are basically saying this very same thing. Poonam, he says, second verse of this chapter mentions Vijnana. Vijnana Vedanta of Ram Krishna by Ayan Maharaj mentions it. Brahma Satyam, Jagat Satyam. Does Sri Ramakrishna believe the world to be real, not the projection? No, you have to be very careful here. Brahma Satyam, Jagat Satyam does not mean that the world is real. 
if you see world is real in what sense if you say brahman is a reality and world is a reality that means you have two realities then you have dvaita vedanta and that's a system certainly the world is different from brahman pancha bheda madhvacharya sri madhvacharya speaks about pancha bheda brahman jiva jagat brahman jagat bheda the difference between brahman and jagat brahman is a separate reality god is a separate reality world is a separate reality jiva jagat bheda sentient beings you are separate and the chair you are sitting on is separate and then um, separate means distinct individual realities jiva jiva bheda you are separate from the other person there are 83 people here they are separate individual beings and then there is uh, jiva ishvara bheda you are separate from god brahman or uh, brahman and jiva are separate They're distinct you are not god and jagat jagat bheda the table is separate from the chair uh, every entity in the world is separate from each other in that case you have dualistic religion that means uh, dualism advaita vedanta does not believe that the world is a separate reality that means sri ramakrishna says in what sense he would say jagat is satyam if he does say at all he says it is true as brahman ramana maharshi says something very interesting he says who can say the world is real who can say that the world is real we think an ignorant person says the world is real another from an advaitic perspective an ignorant person says the world is real no ramana maharshi says it is only the brahmagyani who can say the world is real uh, because the brahmagyani is seeing reality the ignorant person says the world is real what does the ignorant person know about reality the ignorant person doesn't know anything about reality the ignorant person is living in a dream it is the one who is awake to the reality of brahman and sees everything as brahman that person sees reality and that reality is the reality of the world that is brahman it's not the world we are inhabiting this world which we we see around ourselves is definitely a projection is this the gita coming to refer to let me see correct this is the one Madhusudan Saraswati is Gurhatta Deepika. It's translated by Swami Gambhidandi. This was his final work. It's from Vedanta Express also, the same, it's the same book. Ramya says, the Advaiti Jnana as described by Madhusudan Saraswati. Is it possible to reach this state without attaining the Jnana as per Sri Ramakrishna? Yes, in fact, first you have to realize this. And uh, one might realize this and not be worried about Vigyana any further. Would that person be free? Would, it, would that person get moksha? Would that person be a Jivan Mukta? Certainly. Why not? But that person would be someone like Totapuri, for example, uh, for whom this entire world, including his own body, uh, including even God, for example, is an appearance. Okay, it's fun. But nothing important can be easily dismissed. But uh, to then why would Sri Ramakrishna stress Vigyana Vedanta? For example, Shiva Jnana Jiva Seva, to serve all beings in the knowledge that it is Shiva. It is possible only in Vigyana Vedanta. Now, what would be the classical realization, Aparokshana Bhuti of Aham Brahmasmi, that I and Shiva are one, Chidananda Rupa Shivoham. Then what about Shiva Jnana Jiva Seva? Not necessary, there is no Jiva. It is uh, Shiva alone. And the only seva, if you want to do seva at all, would be to teach those so-called jivas that you stop being fools. You are Shiva. Become enlightened. That would be the seva of the enlightened one. Michael Bird says, if any, everything be experienced is imagined, then isn't the concept of Brahman itself imagined? Correct. In fact, the highest Advaita would say, you are consciousness itself. The concept of Brahman itself is definitely imagined. So then it's wrong. No. It's a correction. It's a corrective to all our wrong concepts. So this is where Madhyamaka Buddhism becomes useful. You know, Nagarjuna's sword. That uh, ultimately all the conceptual apparatus you develop is to correct the error of samsara. Once it's corrected, you have to let it go. In um, Madhyamaka Buddhism, the conceptual apparatus is Shunyata. Chatishkoti Vinirmukta Tattvam. The re- that reality which is um, free of the four alternatives of is, 
is not is and is not neither is nor is not so you you have this concept of shunya, shunyata but that also has to be let go um, similarly brahman here also but one has to be very careful here when you say you have let go of brahman then then normally what will happen for people if you tell them oh the brahman is also a, is a concept so you'll plunge back into the world again <laughs> that is that's the most miserable thing that could happen you have to hold on to the idea of uh, spirituality religion god sentient being after all advaita vedanta what does it say it says these are all concepts it, when it says brahman alone is real uh, and jiva is none other than brahman then it says everything that you inhabit is a world of concepts is a world of appearances there is only one absolute reality and that you are but these concepts are useful the concept of brahman seems to be a human concept so what that would mean is before humans were there the concept of a brahman at least as we humans imagine it and are discussing here did not exist and maybe after we are here it will not exist how can we be so certain that the concept of brahman is the one true infinite reality just beyond the subjective creation of man correct now you think about it what you have just asked what is brahman it is awareness unlimited awareness consciousness the moment you say uh, these are concepts and these are human concepts and there was a time before human be now think about carefully what you are saying human concepts this human isn't it also a concept when you say concept don't limit yourself everything that we experience and do these are all concepts there was a time when human beings were not before that um, you know world was there and evolution was going on and there were little cre- creatures evolving from the oceans to the earth, uh, to the land and dinosaurs and all of that all of these are appearances in consciousness is it not see otherwise what has happened is you know we have got this realist materialist realist model so strongly drilled into our minds is that we are completely sure there was a world long before human beings were there and that existed without any human awareness there at all in fact there was a world before any living being was there and that existed quite apart from Uh, any kind of awareness but what advaita vedanta is saying this whole thing you're saying is it not in your consciousness use the dream example in the dream also suppose you didn't know it was a dream somebody came and told you that uh, it's not true that this is a dream you know human beings dream but before human beings evolved all this planet was there the sky was there earth was there uh, even before life evolved so there was nobody to dream then this all these things existed before dream. it sounds very logical the moment you wake up what will happen it all appeared in your dream so think about it um, that's why when you say brahman brahman is just a name but what do you mean by brahman if you drill a little deeper you begin to see um, it's not that easy geeta dev says Pranam Maharaj is the fact that so few turn towards spirituality seriously rather than as a source of achieving one's desires or merely cultural practices indicate that such souls have already lived many lives and have evolved spiritually correct. They don't stumble into serious religion just by chance, no. Uh, at least the way we understand it, Hinduism, Buddhism, all of these karma theorists, we have uh, generated the competence. If you stumble up, up, upon it, without being ready for it it will make no difference to you you will just you know dabble in it there are a lot of people who do that they dabble in it they buy a books from the bookshop few books and look in the here and there and they say all right a few years later they give it to somebody else the books i've read all of that and that's fine you can you are interested you can take it that's the um stumbling into it it may seem that you have stumbled into it but we don't know how karma works we you meet meeting somebody for two years lee you know um, you met a teacher or a monk or you heard a lecture you had a book but you were ready for it that's why it, it uh, you know uh, it had this impact upon you sangeeta says in this context you mentioned there are some who may well stop after you fully realizing 1880 not feel like going any further but can anyone achieve vigyan or ett state without going first going through the 1880 um if yes does that not prove that the world is not a illusion as stated in the classical advaitic sense thanks can it be done in advaita vedanta no but 
again those who proceed through the path of bhakti devotion to ishwara uh, by the grace of ishwara one might get that realization that all is ishwara all is brahman you are brahman and all is brahman so you have not actually gone through the advaitic uh, vichara paddhati the procedure of advaitic inquiry and yet you get that knowledge by the grace of god it's possible why not um, i mean you may have read the books and then suddenly it clicks and that's the grace of god you did not actually attempt to do all this um, uh, vedanta vichara now if yes does that not prove that the world is not an illusion as stated in the classical advaitic sense no it doesn't because it's in fact proves that the world is an illusion as stated in the classical advaitic sense because what will you realize the iti iti state means what iti means this this what is brahman this here it does not mean this uh, iti iti does not mean i have reaffirmed the world again that is gross materialism <laughs> that what is the iti iti state oh this is a man this is a woman i have now become enlightened this is a man this is a woman this is a car this is a dog it's a cat no iti iti means what seems to be uh, before my enlightenment it seemed to be these are living beings and car and uh, earth and sky all of it is nothing but god in that case what seemed to be man woman dog cat and that seemed to be the only reality earlier that world you were inhabiting that world view which you had what happens to it it was an illusion you will look back upon it and say i was totally mistaken about it i thought it was a man it is actually god i thought it was a woman it is actually god then that man and woman you saw what is it is it something separate or is it none other than god if it is none other than god that other than god man and woman which we saw before enlightenment what happens to it maya mithya the very realization that all is god proves the advaitic um, uh, claim brahma satyam jagat mithya otherwise if the world is not an illusion as stated in classical advaita and you realize everything is god then you have got two realities god and the world then you have got dvaita again and then you cannot say everything is god you have to say god alone is god is and then other things are there also there shiva priya says there is no conflict with advaita vedanta as all is a reflection of all pervading brahman brahman itself and brahma itself is an appearance no why should brahman be an appearance the reflection is an appearance yes there is no com- conflict suppose in the lake when i go out there in in the lake i see the reflection in the lake i see houses and trees and now is it's not possible that there can be houses and lakes and trees where there is only water can it be water and houses and lakes and trees no but it is entirely possible that it can be water and reflections of houses lakes and trees the reflections are not really houses lakes and trees uh, houses uh, trees and sky Uh, so the reflections are reflections similarly brahman has no conflict at all with the world appearance but if you say it's a solid separate independent world then there is a conflict definitely pravir basu says explanation of prakriti seems to be different from sankhya what shri krishna has said here is yes it's a little different from sankhya but you can clearly see there are elements of sankhya even the term prakriti is pretty sankhyan actually so um again and again in Krish- uh, in the bhagavad gita you will find elements of sankhya but it seems to be a peculiar mixture of upanishadic uh, cosmology and sankhyan cosmology rick says it is said everything is consciousness in that is that true of nirguna brahman or does consciousness come into play only with saguna brahman if nirguna then consciousness must exist but there be anything to be conscious of correct yes the word consciousness we are using it becomes evident as what we call consciousness only when body mind senses and objects appear then it becomes we are conscious and so that which enables us to be conscious must be consciousness itself so um, then shall we say that nirguna brahman is not consciousness no uh, it it must be consciousness as we understand it Uh, but maybe you cannot use the term for it um, just when it is nirguna brahman it's beyond all language but the best that we can say about it is it is being it is awareness it is bliss 
And one way of understanding this is that when you say Nirguna Brahman is being itself, that means you can't say that it doesn't exist. When you say that Nirguna Brahman is consciousness itself, you can't say that it is an inert thing or it's not conscious. When you say Nirguna Brahman is bliss itself, you can't say that it is affected by any kind of sorrow or limitation of suffering. So in a negative sense, one can understand these terms. Krishnamurti says, how is para prakriti same as jiva? Is it, it is a bit difficult to map it to the concept of Vedansa. Is it a reference to Anandamaya Kosha? No, para prakriti here, when uh, Krishna says, my para prakriti is jiva, he says it here. Um, so he says, This para prakriti, jiva bhuta. Now, what is this jiva? It is consciousness plus the anandamaya kosha. Then, then anandamaya kosha is that little fraction of ajnana, which is a part of uh, maya. And this consciousness itself is nothing different from that pure consciousness. It's just because of the presence of these upadhis, it seems to be different. Bill, uh, where is Bill? Yes. Please unmute yourself. You, see, you uh, skipped over my question, which I'll, oh. I'll just read it out. It's two up. Oh, yes. Bill says, but he, Saguna Brahman, uh, is the one sporting and each as each jiva seeking reunion. Absolutely. Ultimately, if Saguna Brahman is each of us, then beyond Saguna Brahman and beyond us, there must be one reality. Then only it appears as Saguna Brahman and as Jiva. So that reality beyond Saguna Brahman, beyond God, uh, is Nirguna Brahman. From that perspective, we and Saguna Brahman are one. But the moment you come down to the level of Prakriti, uh, then that pure consciousness or Nirguna Brahman now appears as Saguna Brahman and we appear as Jiva. And our relation to Saguna Brahman as Jiva is one of devotion. Of surrender. Uh, we cannot say that I am uh, the reality of Saguna Brahman. Then my reality is the reality of Saguna Brahman or Meister Eckhart's words. The ground of my soul and the ground of God is one and the same. Okay. Then Anjali, can you unmute yourself? Pranam Maharaj, you skip my question Maharaj. Oh, I've been skipping lots of questions. I think I'm hurrying around. We have gone really well, well over time. That's why. <laughs> All right, we'll yeah. take the question here. Yeah. The higher consciousness and lower consciousness are the same as pure consciousness and reflected consciousness. Uh, higher consciousness, lower consciousness means um, Ishwara and Jiva in that sense, you are saying. I am not going to go into pure consciousness, reflected consciousness yet. They are different um, concepts because the idea of reflected consciousness, he has not bought in here. And that's some later Vedanta. Krishna is just talking about higher consciousness here means Ishwara. Pure consciousness plus Maya. And lo so-called lower consciousness. He, he does not use higher consciousness, lower consciousness. He uses the terms higher Prakriti and lower Prakriti. Higher Prakriti is Ishwara. And lower Prakriti is... Uh, uh, higher Prakriti is Jiva. And lower Prakriti is material nature. Universe. I am pure consciousness. And with Prakriti, I become Ishwara. Now, this Prakriti has two aspects. One is this material nature and one leads to that same pure consciousness appearing as all these individual sentient beings. So this is a slightly different way, paradigm of presenting the same thing which we have studied. Vedansar system is very detailed and very geometrical and neat. This is much more ancient. Uh, so here, the distinction between Sankhya and Upanishadi cosmologies is not as clear as it became maybe later on. Good. All right, let's Thank you. Uh, bring it to a close here. Before I skip over any more questions, I think Srinivas Raj, you wanted to ask something? You have to unmute yourself. Pranam Maharaj, you've skipped my question as well. Oh, see, I've been skipping I'm so sorry. many questions. Let me see. Um, where is the question? I think last but one or two. Oh, last but one or two. Uh, 
Um, about Atma Shatakam, the last verse. Why don't I see it? You can you read it out? Yeah, the last verse of uh, one second. Let me just uh, unmute myself. You are unmuted. Yes. Yeah, the last verse of Atma Shatakam, I think, also talks of the same thing that nothing is separate from consciousness. Sankaracharya. I Atma see. Satakam, Nirvana Satakam, the last verse, I, I think also it uh, uh, culminates that everything is uh, consciousness only, not separate from consciousness. That is true. That is true. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. All right, on that high Thank note, you, let sir. us conclude. Yeah. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Arpanamastu.